Sally said, it does sort of bring back whenever you're in these places, your time at university looking, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it will uh, uh, be a uh, positive experience today for people. Um, I'm going to talk about the future vision for children's services. Um, it is a difficult time, and I'm going to touch on that, but I think at a difficult time, Sally says, we need a real vision for how we are going to deliver the best outcomes for our children and young people. Uh, and that's been a piece of work that we've been engaged with over the last uh, six or seven months. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I think, is just talk a little bit about the background, uh, some of the um, issues that I think we all face as organisations, and then take you through uh, the children's uh, vision and plan, uh, which I have shamelessly uh, thought covered in these slides. Um, so, so, as I say, really, we all face a time of uncertainty, I think, in relation to both the overall um, life generally, but I think within the context of um, our own particular situations in England and in Shropshire. We know that there is, it is a time of great organisational change and that carries huge risks. I think colleagues, health, education, uh, the council and so on are finding that the context of their job has shifted radically. Um, we all are facing something called a rev well, I put revised Ofsted framework. People who are working in schools will say, yes, we're already subject to that. The children's services generally, Ofsted are going to bring in a new inspection uh, approach. Uh, those of you who remember far, about, far enough back, it's the, it was the Joint Area Review when they looked, they had inspectors from every service. Now um, uh, they're going back to that to some extent, so they will be inspecting police, health, education, social care, and so on. So that's a great challenge to us, actually. It, it, I, I can understand entirely why they're actually doing it, because it is about looking at the journey of the child through the system rather than looking at any specific service. But it won't be good enough, I think, for individual services to say, we are compliant, we are doing our best within our organisation. We will all be judged on the basis of how well we're working one with the other. Uh, we face a time of changing government priorities. Uh, that's natural for any government in power. Um, however, I think some of these priorities are particularly challenging. Uh, as I said, some of the, some of the organisational change, for example, uh, schools going into academy status uh, and uh, a degree of uncertainty around um, their ongoing responsibilities in relation to working with other agencies. Now, if we move into looking at Shropshire, what is, what is specific about Shropshire in all this? Um, we know at the moment we've got falling or sacking numbers of children and young people uh, in the county. In some areas, um, interestingly enough, we've actually got growth, but the overall quantum of children and people it, it, it is static. Uh, for most children in Shropshire, they do well. Uh, if you look at any indicator, health, education, and so on. But we know um, that there are some children uh, who, who don't. In this county, we have particular difficulties about delivering services in sparse areas. We did a calculation, I think, on our delivery of education in the county, and it costs us about four million pounds more than uh, authorities that don't have those uh, same distances uh, and, uh, and the smaller schools. The downside of being good in relation to uh, raising achievement is that some children um, do very well, but actually the gap between those children um, who are um, receiving free school meals or from deprived households and those uh, who aren't is growing bigger. So we're not engaging as well as we might with some of the youngsters who, um, where, where they're not really fulfilling their potential. We do have to find pockets of deprivation in the county. Everybody will know those. They're quite difficult to spot in some towns because they, they, they um, are a particular street or, or, or a uh, particular district. But nevertheless, if you look at the indicators, um, our deprivation is just as um, uh, severe as many other authorities. We, the, the other area that is different about Shropshire is we have something like 350 children from other local authorities placed in Shropshire 
that stands up against 210, 215 children uh, by the local authority itself. So if you're going to have a quick look at the county, we can see that okay, but essentially uh, we've got about 68,000 children in this county. Um, children uh, who might be judged as having, for example, an unhealthy weight, 22,000. Children with a mental health need, 6,800. Children who are known to us about special educational needs, about 2,000 children. And as I said, it says here children of our both counts for approximately 250, more like 210, uh, slight four. But it gives you a sense, I think, about the quantum and then some of those children that we would regard as vulnerable children. And the particular challenge, actually, is not necessarily the children who are looked after, because we know about those children uh, and we're able to identify and address their needs. We know about children who are subject to safeguarding plans. Uh, which is roughly about 190 children. The children that we don't know as much as perhaps we ought to about that vulnerable group um, who sit between uh, the very defined group and the more um, universal. Well, we can't see that at all. But, uh, just, j j just to say that that's a map of Shropshire which really shows um, that where it's the darker colours, you've got your deprivation around uh, Shrewsbury and places like that, in, in the lighter areas are the areas where there's less deprivation. It demonstrates there are pockets of deprivation in our county uh, that we need to address. Um, not long ago, um, we had something called the Peer Review, which is a group of um, professionals from other authorities, um, including people from a health, education and police background. Uh, and they came in and looked at us, talked to a lot of you as part of that peer review, and reflected back um, to us the things that we ought to be thinking about and doing. Uh, the, um, the general consensus of the peer review was we were continuing to make good progress on a lot of areas, but they felt that we didn't have an overall clear direction and vision um, in, in respect to children's services. Uh, there were some particular challenges around clearer referral pathways and early support. And I think uh, part of the back to basics work that Sophie and others will be presenting on uh, today is a response to that. It's about how do we um, make uh, the referrals of some of those vulnerable children uh, more straightforward? How do we offer early advice and support to some of the professionals dealing with those children? And so we work hard on that. Um, they also said that uh, MASH, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a multi-agency service hub. It's, it's uh, bringing together the statutory agencies of health, police, uh, social care um, to look at the referrals and to work on a multi-agency basis in terms of uh, thinking about how we respond to those groups. And they, they felt that uh, that wasn't sufficiently uh, developed and we've been working on that and I think we're almost at the point now when we have our equivalent of a mini match. Uh, they felt that there was a real challenge around uh, our children and health services um, uh, and uh, following through on the work that we had already done uh, which, which uh, to, to a better commissioning of that service. They also were saying to us, well, when you go to the safeguarding board uh, and look at the practice there, we have lots of information about social care. In fact, people, you know, loads and loads and loads of it. Very little about what other agencies um, contribute in relation to safeguarding. And that's a real challenge for the safeguarding board. And I know it's one that Sally is picking up uh, with um, all of us. The um, safeguarding board focus from the business plan um, covers three uh, groups of children, or three areas rather. Uh, first of all, missing children. And, and one of the concomitants, or one of the issues about having a high number of looked after children in this uh, county is that we have quite a lot of uh, children who will go missing. They're placed here from far away. Initially, when they're trying to get settled, they may. Uh, feel they want to get back home or whatever. And I know that Jim and his colleagues uh, spend a lot of time um, uh, finding some of these children and returning them back to their homes. There are also obviously children living in Shropshire who go missing uh, and um, those who care of us as a local authority. 
Uh, as Sally was indicating, this is a particularly vulnerable group. Uh, the Rochdale experience indicates that this is a group that they're easily um, uh, taken advantage of by, by, by uh, particular groups, and it could lead to things as serious as sexual exploitation. So it is an area where we are very concerned uh, to make sure that we've done everything we possibly can to ensure those children are safe. And, and we've been meeting with private providers and others around that. Uh, similarly, uh, the issue of compromised parenting is a really important um, area. Um, in a way, I think one of the uh, interesting opportunities, and I'll touch on that when we come to the children's plan in a minute, is um, the need not to just deal with children and young people, but to deal with the families and deal with it in a holistic way. The truth is that we're not going to really address the needs of children unless we address the needs of their parents, and some of those uh, parents are... Um, you know, have mental health difficulties in a lot of instances, some will have drugs and substance misuse issues or alcoholism, and that compromises their ability to be a good parent. Uh, what we're really keen to do, I think, and part of one of my many titles is I'm the Director of People Services for Shropshire, so I cover both adults and children, and I'm keen to make sure in my time that we have our adult services and children's services working effectively together. Uh, the third uh, area uh, of, of the um, safe going board business plan is about communication. And it's about communication not only downwards but upwards. It's about trying to make sure we're all talking to each other better, we're all more familiar with the things that we need to do, uh, and so on. And that's absolutely critical. Um, so, sorry, I'm keeping just an eye on the time because what I am going to do at some point is going to bring Jim and, and Karen, Jim Tosa from uh, the place in Karen Morton, where Karen is. Uh, into this, so I don't want to squeeze all that time out. Okay, so, <laughs> thanks, Jim. Uh, so, the process, um, we've been doing uh, a number of pieces of work uh, collectively uh, across all groups. Um, one has been about the reshaping and safeguarding the children's trust. Um, we, we have uh, as you know, reduced the number of people sitting on the safeguarding board uh, chaired by Sally to roughly about 21, 22 people when it's a much bigger group. However, um, we've always taken the view that the safeguarding board is much more uh, than uh, uh, the, 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 the board chaired by Sally. There are a series of working groups which I suspect most of you are in. Uh, it is a collective, but it's about trying to get it to a shape which makes it effective as a body, and I think Sally is uh, bringing in an independent chair, and lay people has been a really effective um, uh, step for us in terms of making the safeguarding board fit for purpose. Uh, the Children's Trust, similarly, was a very big body. We've slimmed that down to about six to eight senior managers, because, uh, again, it is impossible to do effective commissioning if you have a very, very large group. And part of uh, how effective children's services, young people's services will be in Shropshire is how effectively the safeguarding board and the children's trust works together. Because the safeguarding board essentially has a role in looking at um, how we, we make children and young people as safe as we possibly can, but they have no power of itself to commission or change the way services are delivered. The role of the children's trust is to have that dialogue with the safeguarding board and others to ensure that we are reshaping services uh, in order to achieve those better outcomes. So that, that, that reshaping for me is a very important set of steps, and it's still, it's still work in progress. Similarly, we have this thing called the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, uh, and some of you will have a, uh, you know, various levels of understanding of that. This, again, is a really, really important body. It's set up within the context of the health reforms, um, I know Karen may want to say a word or two about that, but we have deliberately um, timed our children's trust so it backs to back with the executive of the Health and Wellbeing Board because um, traditionally there has been uh, a feel that somehow children's services, young people's services, not punched its weight uh, as much as it should in terms of that di wider dialogue with the health community. Um, and I think the Health and Wellbeing Board gives us that fantastic opportunity to do so. And the commitment of the Clinical Commissioning Group uh, to the issues of safeguarding, I think, is underlined by the presence of Karen Morton here today. Because I think um, uh, Karen Morton's official title, I always get it wrong, is it Chief Executive Officer? 
a capable officer for the clinical, I want to call you chief executive. Right. This, so Karen is the accountable officer of the Clinical Commissioning Group, and I think her, her presence here today shows that we have taken our relationships with health colleagues to uh, a, a new level in this area. Um, we have, you've all got in your packs a refresh uh, children and people's plan, I'm going to very briefly take you through that. Is that right? Do you know <laughs> These documents are all very good, aren't they? Uh, uh, you look at them after about a year and they all look out of date. So uh, what we've got to be absolutely committed to is this is a statement in time of where we're at. We need to keep it constantly refreshed. But it is the root plan in relation to uh, developing uh, a direction of travel. At times of difficulty, when organisations are travelling in different directions, People are cutting services right back from the centre. We all have to, having to buy millions of pounds of savings. It becomes even more important, all of us, to understand what the direction of travel is. And that's why I think it's so important to have effective institutions like the Children, Children's Trust, the Safeguarding Board, and the Children and People's Plan with a vision of where we're going to go. Because actually, that you know, it's more important now than it ever has been. Uh, the last point of piece of work that we've been doing is small world children and young people um, and more effectively engaging with them. We've, we've had a piece of work undertaken by one of our graduate trainees in the council uh, who's been talking to loads and loads of services, talking about how they involve children and young people and what difference does it make. Uh, and we want to instill that culture and that approach across all agencies, all settings. Uh, but in relation to the children's plan, we have involved uh, a number of children and young people who have helped us craft um, uh, the vision uh, and also comment on the children and young people's plan and the priorities uh, and that's been extraordinarily helpful. So if I come on to the vision, um, well, one of the things that the children and young people put into the plan, uh, we were all for them being healthy, safe and reaching their full potential. Uh, but weren't too bothered about them being happy. And I think uh, the young people pointed out to us that along the way they would quite like to be happy as well. So, so um, that's our vision uh, for what we want to try and achieve in Shropshire. It is aspirational, um, it is ambitious, but it is something we should actually use as our benchmark, our touchstone when we're considering um, how uh, we de live, deliver and develop our services and the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Okay. So remember that, because I'm going to ask you to come back in a minute and do a little exercise on this. But I'm just going to take you through some of the headlines. Now, uh, as I said, again indebted to Carolyn, as I've lifted this straight from your slides. <laughs> um, we, we've um, got five areas that we are um, particularly focusing on in the Children and Young People's Plan. We built it like a house. Uh, and, and the foundation of that house is that children are safe and well looked after in a supportive environment. That's, without that thing there, pretty much nothing else in the house uh, can work. Then going across from left to right, my left to right. Um, your left to right. Narrowing the achievement gap in education and work, and I'll talk a bit about more about that. The mental health and well-being of children, uh, keeping children healthy, and then right on the roof, make sure that everything's watertight, making a positive impact, and having views recognised. And in a way, if you see nothing more than that, and in terms of disseminating to this, this is our children's plan at a glance. So just a, I'm just going to pick out a few points from each of these. Um, as I said right from the beginning, I think ensuring children and young people are safe, we need a whole family approach. Uh, and um, we are, people will have heard of the Troubled Families Programme. Uh, in Shropshire, um, we are calling it a Supporting Families Initiative. And that's a really important um, piece of work. It's important because it does engage and target some of those most vulnerable um, 
uh, families. Clive, how many? How many, how many, uh, how many families have we got then? 455. Okay. Uh, we've got 455 families that we've identified that meet the criteria uh, in relation to the supporting families initiative. Sorry, David, 455 Um, I, I think it's important on two fronts really. One is because doing a piece of work with some of those families uh, before um, they get to a position where we have to remove children or do more dramatic things. Um, but secondly, it's an opportunity for us, I think, to reflect as a professional community about how we do engage with those families, um, whether we really all need to have so many people involved, and whether there's a different way of working with those families. So I think there's some really interesting um, uh, possibilities there and, and people uh, will be able to find out about that initiative um, through the website I think. Um, uh, we talked about, uh, I'm not going to touch on the early help stuff because I think that's going to be covered this afternoon. Uh, we are particularly keen I think in, in uh, developing uh, opportunities to work with young people on the edge of care. Um, people may be familiar with something called the Southwark Judgment where um, 16, 17 year olds who are homeless um, are deemed children in need and therefore to be taken into care. Um, sometimes actually taking children at 16 and 17 into care isn't the right thing to do. You can help those children without necessarily making them children uh, in care and we're looking at different ways we might support those children. Um, I'll touch on the pooled budgets for specialist resources. Some of you will deal with those really difficult children um, who are particularly vulnerable, uh, have complex needs, and usually need very expensive um, placements that sometimes aren't in Shropshire. Uh, traditionally, um, I've been negotiating those deals for about 30 years, and they feel like they take 30 years to arrange, actually, uh, because there's so many people to talk to and agree and all the rest of it. What we've agreed, which I think is the first sign of the different way of working between the council and the clinical commissioning group, uh, and our education service is, is a pooled budget where we all manage a budget where everybody commits to that budget uh, and you don't have uh, is this a health case, is this an education case, is this a social care case. That doesn't mean to say we have unlimited money, quite the reverse, we are going to have to be incredibly tight uh, and not everybody knows we have to manage within that budget but I think for those children who do need these resources this is a really important step. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention on that is increased focus on permanence. Some people not, may not be familiar with that, but this is about saying let's try and find the most secure setting for any young person, whether it be in their own home, whether it be uh, living in substitute care, i.e. with a relative, or, a, or, or whether it be uh, going all the way and being placed for adoption. But it's saying if you're not secure as a young person, you're not going to make the progress you need. And we're absolutely committed, and people will be aware, talking about government priorities, that adoption is very high up um, on the government's agenda. Interestingly enough, of course, the Secretary of State, Michael Gove, himself was an adopted child, and therefore had a particular perspective on this. Um, another of my uh, interesting titles is I am the Director of Education for Shropshire, uh, and therefore, um, uh, and I am absolutely passionate about the importance of education and achievement for young people, about building their own resilience, uh, and um, as I say, in Shropshire we have a good education provision, children do well na uh, in, in nationally, however we, we can't afford to slacken our pace there. We do know we have the highest number of statemented children um, in Shropshire, uh, in comparison with our statistical neighbours with very high numbers of state of children. Uh, that could be a good thing because we're identifying lots of children's needs. On the other hand, it could be that we're not meeting their needs as effectively as we might locally uh, without having to go through a formal statement. So we are looking at reviewing our educational provision, which is children with special educational needs. These are children who, of themselves, are particularly vulnerable children. Uh, and we want to try and uh, provide for those children as local as we can. Uh, people will be aware of the government's uh, priority around pupil premium, and it's about saying, let's try and use that pupil premium as opposed to just propping up school budgets to um, shape provision for the 
particularly disadvantaged groups that, uh, that generate people premium in the first place. Uh, the government are uh, expanding the two-year-old uh, free education places. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, this uh, business of giving children better access to apprenticeships. Uh, the council itself is uh, trying to do more on that front, but I'm particularly passionate uh, around that for our looked after children, because I think we want those children to go on and be good parents uh, and people who can sustain their own families. Uh, we need to give them effective education training uh, and then into employment. Um, hopefully, um, no one would take issue with any of that. Uh, perhaps I just people will be familiar, I think, with the CAM service, which I've got to say, when I um, was talked through it by Helen Bailey, it blew me away in terms of the stuff that they are doing in schools, and we, we would like to see more schools access that. Uh, the CAM service, uh, as I said, we are working with clinical commissioning group and other colleagues in terms of looking at what the future outcomes of that service uh, and shape of that service could be. Uh, and we are particularly interested in this whole area of extension of personalisation for children uh, uh, with disability in their families. Uh, and I think that will be a lot of the direction of travel. And then on keeping poor children healthy and using health and equality, I don't want to take anything that um, uh, uh, Karen might want to comment on here, but um, our children's centres are an absolute uh, rock bed of things that we should be doing around developing preventative support. We do have the opportunity over the next couple of years with the expansion of health visitor numbers uh, to have uh, a more integrated service. What was pointed out to us by the peer review is it looks quite good from 0 to 5 and you have reasonable youth provision. It's the bit in between that isn't very coordinated and joined up. And I think one of the things that we need to be looking at is that 5 to 11 area, that primary age group. It's not altogether straightforward because a number of those services are themselves commissioned by schools uh, and trying to do that then in an orchestrated way um, is complex. But I think we could do better uh, thinking about how we support uh, children in those areas. The Health and Wellbeing Board has, has um, picked out um, tackling obesity or keeping children in a healthy way. Yeah, so, so it is actually, uh, we might even want to rewrite that bit. Um, uh, as our, one of our key targets. If you ever look at a map of um, uh, where those children who aren't a healthy weight live, and then you um, contrast it with a map of deprivation, it's probably one of the best indicators uh, in relation to correlation between deprivation and obesity. Uh, so in a way, um, you know, it's a good thing to look at, particularly if we're interested in narrow uh, the gap between those groups and, and other children. Um, we're already doing really, really well uh, on uh, reducing the levels of teenage conceptions, and I think it's been a testament, when you talk to the team that has done that work, it is a testament to early education as being the absolute key uh, <coughs> to dealing, dealing with issues of teenage conception, but probably uh, we need to work hard to keep the numbers low. And as I said, the Health and Wellbeing Board, I think, offers us real opportunities to work at a whole different level um, with um, health partners and others. So lastly on the, um, and then I'm going to get you to do an exercise uh, for 10 or 15 minutes, so, so uh, uh, have your children and people's plan handy. Um, <coughs> lastly, it's about uh, supporting and encouraging children and young people to make a positive impact. The, um, the council is faced with some real problems about funding, as you know. We're having to make something like about £20 million pound saving next year. Uh, looks like we're getting some attendant pressure, which might mean that's more like £25 million. And it's always easy to, well, that's not easy, but the, 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 the sort of lazy way of making that money is to say, well, let's just cut out all the you know, non-essential services. However, you know, things like youth work and early intervention, youth support, it's really, really important that we keep those things going because those are the things that actually um, stop uh, a lot of children slipping into uh, much more difficult areas and problems. So, um, 
a priority for us is about focusing our youth support. So we really are identifying and targeting the most vulnerable children in communities. And we're looking at how we do that in a more coordinated way across our universal youth offer, our targeted youth services, and our career service. Um, we do need to rely on local groups, voluntary groups, and others to deliver some of our most our, 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 our more universal services. And increasingly, we're going to have to do that. Uh, we are in Shropshire, lucky I think that we've got uh, very strong communities, often um, people who um, are active entrepreneurial and wanting to um, uh, uh, set up things for young people. Uh, so it is about how we work in partnership with those, those groups. Um, the thing that came out for me around the work we did on young people shaping services is we listen to young people a lot, but I'm not sure we do an awful lot as a result of what they tell us. And I think a challenge for us is uh, what in offset terms would be the so what test. You listen to young people, they told you about this, so what did we do differently? And I think that's something we need to keep as a theme all the way through um, as we're driving this children and people's plan through. And the thing that I think is, again, is missing uh, in any uh, organised or orchestrated way is the involvement of, um, of parents in that process as well. Um, and lastly, I suppose it's just about making sure we work with partners um, to, to make sure we're not asking the same young person uh, to attend about six groups to give their views. Because they, I do occasionally meet young people who've got sort of consultation fatigue actually on these things. So that's that's the uh, bones, if you like, of the children and people's plan. Now, what I would like you to do is little exercise in twos and threes, sitting where you are, don't move. Um, is I just like this is the plan um, and the direction of travel. I would like you in your twos and threes. First of all, a, a quick conversation about does that look about right? Secondly, um, uh, some thoughts about what might be the obstacles to doing this to delivery. Because I'm, I'm aware that I can stand up here and talk about the strategic direction and all this stuff. It all sounds very nice. But actually, when we're trying to deliver it on the ground and really make a difference, what are the things that get in the way? So I'd really, really like to hear from that. And thirdly, if people have any other thoughts or ideas or comments, um, uh, I, I'd be interested in that. Now, I'm not going to spend, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to literally pick up, say, five minutes-ish feedback. So I want to finish by just about 25 to that exercise to give Jim and Karen a bit of time themselves to think back. Is that all right? So in twos and threes, it's first of all, have you got it about right? Is there anything missing? <coughs> Secondly, problems for delivery. Thirdly, any other areas, ideas that people might have? Okay? Thank you very much.
operation are. And I suppose we will actually be reviewing phase three and delivering the strategy of the plan, which you know, for us is a little challenging to do that. But sometimes just bus routes are there, the basics are there, and I wondered how that was going to be addressed. Your strategies and stuff seem really good, and obviously the, the plan itself seems really good. But obviously, we started discussing from a residential side with sort of carers and stuff for the young people, but. What, what sort of the consequences or actions going to be for the parents or families who refuse to get involved or don't get involved in their child's upbringing or don't get involved in the meetings and stuff? What, what's the implications then? Because obviously we're still footing the bill for a child or a person whose parent can't actually be bothered to put the time and effort in place. Yeah. So, so essentially your comment is about how will this work as we get engaged with your parents? Yeah. I, I, I think it's really important that the child is at the centre of all this and it's lovely to hear that you're talking about consultation and I just think it's really, really important that that continues. I think it's, we can base it on our own family life, we need to talk to our own children and, and, and they come up with some fantastic ideas and they really challenge us so I just hope that that really does continue and that's from the youngest as well, not just the sort of those that are uh, in difficulty, but all, all everyday children in the schools, in the nurseries, everywhere really. And also the parents, the parents are absolutely key. They've got, that you know, there are people who do want to help. And actually, if you approach them in the right way, perhaps, sometimes maybe we get not quite the, the communication right. If we approach them right, they might actually be on board um, and, and, and we build that trust up, don't we? So I think it's really important. Thank you very much. Uh, just down there, and I'll take one. <coughs> We really like the um, whole family approach, just to be mindful not to lose sight of the child at the centre of it and take the focus away from them and look at the parents and the other issues. It's very, it's very helpful, kind of, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have one more thought, comment? Person down here, Audrey.
and uh, you know, as I said before, the achieving closer work with partners and so on. So um, it, it seems to me the challenge is uh, how we work together for shared outcomes. So we really focus on those outcomes. We don't just get locked in. We're in. Uh, education, so this is what we're worried about, or we're in social care, or we're in health, or we're in whatever. It's about concentrating on the outcomes of our contribution to that. Um, I've said before about the accountability for all agencies in terms of the things they're doing, particularly in relation to safeguarding. Um, we're all going to be faced with budget reductions. I think before we um, uh, make irrevocable steps, it's important we're talking to partners along the way. So certainly from the council's point of view, I will be rehearsing with Children's Trust the sorts of pressures we're facing next year, the areas that we're thinking of reducing, and getting partner feedback and saying actually how do you think that will impact on you uh, and vice versa. I think that's so important. Um, and I think we've just got to open our minds to some innovation. You know, at times, uh, tough times, sometimes we just need to think outside the box and, and give some space within our uh, world and time to just just try out those new ideas. And at this point, I've got the... I think so, again. Right, and actually, just so people can see what young people thought about it, before I ask you that. Should run from here. <laughs> so talk amongst yourselves. Uh, <laughs> Hello, I'm Lorraine Warrender and I work with the Shropshire NYPs and the Speak Out group. Well, we're here today in the Lantern on the last day of the summer holidays 2012 to discuss the children and young people strategy vision. So what is the vision? Here it is. Let's see what young people in the SOAP group and the NYPs think of this vision. This is nothing about happiness. I think vision gets the nail on the head. It is clear that the Children's Trust between, believe in equality between disadvantaged people and more stable people, which is all we can ask for. I think, I think that the language is a bit too hard for disabled people and young people to understand. All children and young people, including those who are vulnerable or disadvantaged, will be healthy, safe and reach their potential, supported by their families and the wider community. In short, Shropshire will be a place where children and young people can flourish. We like the word all in this statement just read because we felt it was inclusive of everyone, although the fact that including was mentioned afterwards sort of hinted that it wasn't actually inclusive of everyone, and the words vulnerable and disadvantaged weren't really explained fully enough. We didn't know who they meant by vulnerable and disadvantaged. It then said we will be, will be healthy, safe and reach their potential, and we love the use of the words healthy, safe and potential, although we would like happiness to be mentioned as well. Supported by their families and the wider community was also good, but the wider community was too broad and vague and families and community are excellent choices of words. And then the last point was that flourish was too posh, and so we went for developing growth instead. All children and young people will be healthy, happy, safe, and reach their full potential, supported by their families, friends, and the community. In short, Shropshire will be a place where children and young people can develop and grow. I think supporting children make a contribution it's good because children don't always get their views heard. I think improving education and employment for vulnerable children is important <laughs> because they deserve as much success in later life as more stable children. Ensuring children and young people have a safe and supportive family um, will help them because if they feel safe then they'll feel safe around other people as well. 
I think that improving the physical and mental health and well-being of children and young people by focusing on early intervention and intervention is a good policy because it helped to rapidly decrease the number of mental health cases in Shropshire. We changed narrowing the attainment and employment gap for vulnerable children and young people because um, attainment and employment gap didn't really explain itself very much. So uh, we've come up with providing equal opportunities and support for all of the children and young people in education and care uh, because it's more self-explanatory. The next one was ensuring children and young people are safe and looked after in a supportive family setting. All we did for this one was change the word setting to environment because we felt this was nicer. So it's now ensuring children and young people are safe and looked after in a supportive family environment. And the one after that was supporting children and young people to make a positive contribution and have their views heard. You change this to supporting and encouraging children and young people to make a positive impact and have their views recognised because we felt this was more informative and really told the audience what we were trying to say. Um, improving the physical and mental health and well-being of children and young people by focusing on prevention and early intervention. I felt that instead of improving we should have ensuring as this suggests that there are many children who are physically and mentally um, unhealthy and we felt that mental health and physical well-being should be separate um, issues because they are different and we change it to ensuring the physical well-being of children and young people by early intervention through guidance and education and separately ensuring mental health of children and young people by early intervention through guidance and education. How will we know if the children's trust are getting it right? We at so Group have discussed this and we have come to the conclusion that the children's trust will not be able to know in any easy way if they're getting it right. For example, in 10 years, the number of disadvantaged people um, with a job could go up, but that could just as easily be because there are more jobs available or more people are suited to it without the children's trust getting involved. How, how would you like the, to engage in the children's trust people's plan and the children's trust? We at uh, SOGU did not know what either of these were before today, so we believe that the uh, Children's Trust need to advertise both of these via various um, formats and platforms to young people. How would you like to express the vision? Yeah. I think we should express the vision by advertising it and talking to friends and put it on all media like Facebook, Twitter, etc and design the Children's Trust logo. But at the moment, I think we shouldn't be able to because we never knew what it was. So if we get loads of, pit, loads of children and ideas of children, then we are able to add, um, design the logo. Okay, and is there anything else that, pe that young people want the tr Trust to know? We at So Group would like to meet the people of the Children's Trust and discuss how they think it would be best to implement their vision. How do we know if we're getting it right? Well, we can do things like look at the statistics and see whether the gap for attainment and employment has narrowed or if it's widened. Uh, we can do things like... Um, Russ, I think you've got the flavour. Um, actually, we remember those young people when we were actually drafting them and they were, uh, as I spent the day doing that, and we actually, it was really valuable to hear their perspective. So we tried to put young people right at the heart of this. The trick now would be to actually make sure at every level we involve young people in that way. Well, what I'd like now to do is just invite Jim Tozer um, to say a few words.